Thank you, Brother Albert. And uh, did you finish or not? I'm, I'm finished. Okay, very good. Then uh, we will um, pick on Brother Dale Crosby to open his mic and to lead us in prayer for your service. Our loving Father, we come before you this morning with gratitude of heart and willingness of mind to listen to those things which you are going to present to us through thy servant. We ask for you to open our ears and our hearts to receive this message. And we turn this meeting over to you now, Father, asking you to bless it and to bless also Brother Albert in his service to us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we thank you, Brother Dale. You can turn your mic off now. And uh, Brother and Brother Albert is uh, going to speak to us about Psalms 91, I believe. And did you have any um, thing you needed to share on your screen, Brother Albert? If so, I think you know how to do that. I will share it in a little bit, not right now. Thank you, Brother Bill. Thank, thank you, you, Brother 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 Dale. It. Uh, gives great joy for Sister Norma and myself to attend this Fort Worth convention, online convention. My goodness, what technology has uh, done. It reminds me just of, of uh, the way uh, possibly the ancient worthies will speak to the entire world uh, via uh, a program just like this. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. Uh, uh, Zuckerberg, his desire is to have uh, internet throughout the world, the entire world. Well, you know, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Because then everybody could listen via a uh, medium just like this. Uh, and who could be teaching but the ancient worthies? <clears throat> The, uh, the topic that uh, we chose to uh, talk about today is uh, one that is dear to all of our hearts, Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. When we look at the scripture, we look 
at in, at, in detail, looking at the strong meanings of some of the word, Hebrew words that formulated this scripture. The he in this verse would aptly apply to us, ones that have made a covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father. And the word dwelleth is translated from the Hebrew word yashab. That's to remain, to settle, to abide, to continue, to endure, to establish, to inhabit, to keep house, and to settle down. So this distinctly shows that we should seek permanency in this place, this condition, and cherish it as a beautiful privilege and opportunity. Carrying along in this verse, the dwelling is in where? It's a secret place. Strong's word is say there and means a cover, a covering, a covert, a disguise, or a hiding place, privately protection, and a place not known by ones around us. This gives us the sense of a protected state, a state of being watched over, providing we stay in that dwelling condition. And whose secret place is it? It is the Most High. Strong's meaning Elyon. It's an elevation, a lofty condition, uppermost. And when we are there, what do we do? We shall abide. Meaning to continue, to dwell, to endure, to be left and to lodge and to remain. So where shall we abide? We answer, under the shadow. And the Strong's word is a shade or to defend. The under the shadow of the Almighty, and of course, we know that is the most powerful and to be impregnable. Let us digress for a few minutes and get a small glimpse of the works of the Almighty spoken about in this verse. How much power does this Almighty possess? How vast is his creation? And how big are we in relation to it? Let's take a small glimpse. Remember, all you are about to see was created by this Almighty One that casts the shadow and gives us this dwelling. And in it, He that casts the shadow of protection over us in this secret place. I'm going to share now some. This is the earth where we live. And this is where you live with your neighbors. Here is earth, the sun and the planets. Here's the distance to scale between the earth and the moon. Here's the earth and there's the moon. Think again, inside that distance, you can fit every planet in our solar system nice and neatly. Here's Earth, and here is the moon. So all the planets fit neatly between with about 8,000 kilometers or close to 5,000 miles to spare between. But let's talk about planets that here is Jupiter. North America is this little smudge in compared with the planet Jupiter. And here's the size of Earth 
Well, let's say six Earths compared with Saturn. Here are the six Earths compared with Saturn. And just for good measure, here's what Saturn's rings would look like if they were around Earth. This is what it would look like from the equator. Basically, it's on edge. From Polynesia, from Alaska, and from Washington, D.C. That's what it would look like if Earth had rings like Saturn. This here is a comet that was just landed. They landed a probe on one of these. Here's what one looks like compared with Los Angeles. But that's nothing compared to our sun. Just remember, that's our sun and this is for us. Here's you from the moon. That's Earth. This is the surface of the moon. And here's us from Mars. And here's us from just behind Saturn's rings. Here's Earth. And here's us from just beyond Neptune, four billion miles away, little speck. Let's step back a bit. Here's the size of Earth compared with the size of our sun. There's Earth. Here's a blown up image of it. And this is the sun. And here's that same sun from the surface of Mars. The sun from Mars. But that's nothing again. As once said, there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on every beach on Earth. Now just Imagine that there are more grains of sand, more stars in heaven than there are grains of sand on earth. Now, every, every time you go to a beach, there's sand all over. And if you look at Google and ask how many grains of sand in a handful, it says there are more than 10,000 grains of sand in a handful. Wikipedia says, depending on the size, but there could be 400,000 grains of sand in a handful. And the illustration that is given here on every beach on earth, compared with as many stars in space, that's magnificent. That goes beyond our imagination which means that there are ones much, much bigger stars, that is, than our little wimpy sun. Just look at how tiny and insignificant our sun is. Here is this one star, Canis Margeris, and here is our sun. And it's it right down there. Here's another look. The biggest star, V.Y. Canis Margis, is one billion times bigger than our sun. One billion times bigger than our sun. But none of those compares to the size of a galaxy. In fact, 
if you shrank the sun down to the size of a white blood cell, that's a white blood cell, if you shrank the sun down to that size, and the Milky Way galaxy using the same scale, the Milky Way would be the size of the United States. One little blood cell compared to the United States is comparing the sun to the Milky Way. Magnificent, isn't it? That's because the Milky Way galaxy is huge. This is where we live inside there, that little, little dot right there. But this is all you ever see. All the stars you see at night are just part of this yellow circle. But even our galaxy is a little runt compared with some others. Here's the Milky Way compared to 350 million light years away from Earth. Here's, here's the Milky Way, a tiny, 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 tiny dot right down there compared with 350 light years away from Earth. Just think about all that could be inside. But let's think bigger. In just this picture taken by the Hubble telescope, there are thousands and thousands of galaxies, each containing millions of stars, each with their own planets. Remember, as grains of sand on the sea or on the, on the, on the beach. That's as many stars. Here's one of the galaxies pictured. This galaxy is 10 billion light years away. When you look at this picture, you are looking billions of years in the past. And just keep this in mind. That's a picture of a very small, small part of the universe. It's just an insignificant fraction of the night sky. And you know it's pretty safe to assume that there are some black holes out there. Here's the size of a black hole compared with Earth's orbit. Makes you feel a little insignificant in God's master plan. I'm going to now <clears throat> go back. Totally amazing. And that is who is in charge of casting this shadow for us, giving this protection. That is the person, the creator, the divine being. Makes us think of the scriptures. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And in Hebrews 2, 6, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Yes, when we look at all those pictures of the vastness of the universe, you wonder, who are we? Why? Why is God mindful of us? But we are uh, so fortunate that we have been privileged to understand and to uh, uh, fully comprehend his plan. Now let's read Psalms 91, one again. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Brethren, we just saw a glimpse of the Almighty's hand. Almighty's handwork and the glimpse of what he has created and owns. It is he that provides the shadow of the secret place. 
for us if only we seek it. Oh, what an unbelievable privilege. Today we are living in a most perplexing time and yet in a wonderful time. It is a perplexing time because we see before our eyes a world collapsing, a disintegrating as the wrecking crews are hard at work dismantling this old order as stated in Jeremiah 1.10. And it says, See, I have set this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. It is also a wonderful time because we are on the very threshold of the mediatorial phase of God's kingdom. When all nations shall be blessed, it is a time described in Haggai 2, 6, and 7 saying, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. We are living in the time of the transformation of all the ages. It is as Paul speaks when he used the expression, upon whom the ends of the ages are come. 1 Corinthians, 1, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. For us, it is a joyful time because we know where we are in the plan of God. We know our part in it. We see what is happening. We know the meaning of these events. This gives us a lift as described in the words of Jesus in Luke 21, 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. To the world, it is a different time. To them, it is a time of worry. They see terror and they fear as they see the clouds of trouble gathering. Today, there are constant fears of, ra uh, of radical terrorism threats such as never before known. Radical Islam groups are throughout the world, whole world and even to our own backyards, creating fear like never before. Threats of economic collapse. Rising of prices for the average household. Threats of diseases spreading like HIV, Ebola, and now even the coronavirus. Global warming and climate change and the effects that it's having in the world to weather extremes such as floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, typhoons, droughts, ice caps melting, threats of cyber hacking that could affect every conceivable operation that relies on computer com communication to direct it, to direct its very existence and operation, such as military power grids banking, which includes yours and my banking accounts, and information and info and identity theft, threats against Christianity and anything connected to Christianity and its principles, Political correctness that we can instantly, that can instantly isolate or even kill one's person or business by using wrong words or labels. Threats that weren't even talked or known about just a few short years ago. As Joel states it in Joel 2.2, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. Jesus described this time in Luke 21, 25 and 26, upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. <clears throat> the powers of heaven here referred to are the present ruling powers, civil and ecclesiastical. They are worried and shaken at the possibility of all the threats, as previously stated. Jesus further described these days in Matthew 24, 21 and 22, <clears throat> for then shall be great tribulation such as what not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever even shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. The prophet Daniel also saw these days and stated in Daniel 12, 1, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Paul described this time of trouble in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. All this is symbolic language. What does it mean? It means that men will try to find shelter and security in various human schemes, trusts, and adventures. Will they find 
Will they hide successfully? Will they find refuge from the Lord's wrath? Jeremiah answers that in Jeremiah 23, 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? No, they will not escape. But we know it is all for the benevolent purpose. All selfish human schemes must be discredited and eliminated to make way for the full establishment of God's kingdom on earth. This does not mean that we will escape the entire time of trouble. We are in it now, and it is worsening every day. But unlike the world, we are not afraid. We are not terror-stricken. Why not? It is because we have a refuge. The world does not know. Does not know about a safe and secure hiding place which the Lord has provided for us. Back to Psalms 91 in verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. It says, I will say, meaning I will answer, avouch. I will boast, I will certify, I will challenge, I will command, I will declare. I, I will say of the Lord, the Lord, of course, simply means Jehovah. He is my refuge, the meaning hope, place of refuge, and my fortress, meaning castle, defend, fort, a very strong place. He is my God, that is supreme God. In him will I trust, meaning be confident or sure, be bold, secure, and have confidence. Psalms 46, one to three, it states, God is our refuge and strength in every present time and trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Doesn't that describe the present time precisely? Psalms 32, 7 describes our Lord, our God. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Does this mean we will be miraculously preserved from every physical aspect of the time of trouble? If there are food shortages, will we have an abundance? If wars, terrorist attacks, political correctness that restrains human liberties, will we remain free? If the atmosphere is polluted with diseases and other poisons, will we breathe pure air? Of course not. These things affecting only the fleshly body are comparatively minor. It is in the things, it is in the things that really matter that we will be preserved. Even in famine, there will continue to be an abundance of spiritual food. It will not be rationed. We will continue to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Galatians 5.1. These are the things that really count. Even in a disordered and, distinct, and, and disintegrating world, even in lawlessness and anarchy, Nothing will be permitted to happen to us that's not our highest spiritual welfare. Although we walk about and intermingle with our neighbors, sharing their hardships in reality, we will be segregated in a secret place where no real harm can be, nowhere fall us, where everything we really need is supplied. Dwelling in the secret place. Where is this wonderful secret place? It is not a locality but a condition. It's a relationship, a standing before the Lord, a condition of consecration and acceptance, a condition of justification and spirit begettal. It is living with the Lord. Jesus described this condition in John 14, 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. 
it doesn't make any difference where we live or where we go. We can still be in that secret place. David puts it in this way in Psalms 139, verses 7 to 10. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall my hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. No matter where we are physically or geographically, we can still be safe and secure in the secret place of the Most High. What a great and unusual privilege this is. Psalms 31, 19 and 20 puts it in this way. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid upon them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust thee before the sons of man. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of men. Thou shalt keep them in secret, secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. It is through Jesus our ransom, Savior and Advocate, that a relationship with God is established and maintained. This is how we come into and remain in the secret place of the Most High. There is no other sure refuge or defense at this time. It can only be expected from God. Psalm 62, 5 to 8 states, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved in God, my, and in God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. And in 2 Samuel 22, 2 and 3, it states, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The Lord is my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower <clears throat> and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. Compared with the frantic running around of the world and to find peace and safety, how wonderfully blessed we are. We are safe and secure in the secret place of the Most High. Back to Psalms 91 in verse 3. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noiseless pestilence. Surely, the word surely meaning certainly, doubtless. He, referring to the help of our Lord. He shall deliver to snatch away, to defend. He'll deliver us, escape without fail, part, pluck, preserve, recover, or rescue us. He will deliver thee from the snare, and that meaning from or out, of in many senses, and some we stated. Of the fowler, that's the snare, the snarer, the one that tries to deceive us. From the noiseless pestilence, by implication of falling, of ruin, calamity, iniquity, mischief, mischievous naughtiness. The snare of the fowler refers to the deceptions of Satan that the world is in its present fearful condition and is shaken to its foundations. Isaiah describes this time in Isaiah 24, 17 and 18. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabit, inhabitant of the earth, and it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall Fail, fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. How accurately this, this describes present and impending conditions. 
greatly fearing all the things happening in the world today, some are ready to accept any solution, any form of government, and any attempt to preserve their lives, to climb out of the pit of destruction. How fortunate we are to be beyond the reach of this snare, safely hidden as we are in the secret place of the Most High. There is, however, another snare of the fowler that does endanger us. It is Satan's attempted deception of the Lord's people to draw them from the truth. Paul warns us of this snare and then told us how to keep out of the trap in 2 Timothy 3, 13 and 14. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. How did we learn the truth? Whose mind did the Lord enlighten at the end of the age to make the truth clear to us? Whose books do we use in our Bible studies? What reprints do we consult? What mana text comments do we read each morning? In nothing but Brother Russell's writings and the volumes and the reprints and all his other writings. Peter warns us in 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2, there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring unto themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. These unsound doctrines are what are described as the snare of the fowler and the noiseless pestilence. The Lord's true people are delivered from these because they take Paul's advice. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. The truth is our heritage forever. We should never let it go and revert to error. The psalmist expresses our resolve in Psalms 119, verses 110 and 11. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I err not from, these decept from thy deceptions. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Back to Psalms 91, we read in verse 4, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. The words, he shall cover. To fence in, cover over, that's protect. Defend, hedge in, join together, and to set. He shall cover thee with his feathers, <clears throat> meaning a wing, a protector. And under, meaning underneath. Overspread, an uttermost protection, that of a wing. Thou shalt trust. That means to flee for protection, have hope, make refuge, to put our trust. Thou shalt trust his truth, meaning stability, certainty, trustworthiness, establishment, faithful, right and sure. Shall be thy shield, a hook, shield as, gar as if guarding, and butler, shield and butler, meaning something surrounding the person, that is a shield, an outward protection, an overprotection. Shall cover thee with his feathers. One of the most delightful <clears throat> and heartwarming sights of an animal kingdom is the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. We have all seen pictures of different occasions where a mother hen or dove gives that protection for her chicks. On one such occasion after a forest fire had ravaged an area quick and furious that firefighters in their mopping up of hot spots came across this mother hen partridge her feathers all scorched from the fire 
too much to outlast the heat. She died. Suddenly, the firefighters noticed the little chicks peeking out from under her wings. Yes, she gave her life for her chicks by the protection of her wings. When danger is close at hand, the mother hen gives a certain sound and her chicks run to her. She spreads her wings and makes room for every one of them under her feathers. She is then ready to give her very life for their defense. It is one of the most touching scenes imaginable to see the love and devotion of a mother hen. Jesus used this identical illustration in Luke 13, 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather, gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. This is the kind of love and devotion that is conveyed by the expression, he shall cover thee with thy feathers, with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. The psalmist gives us the same thought in a way that is appropriate for the Lord's people in these troublous times. Psalm 61, 2-4. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast kept, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Psalms 57, one says, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. These beautiful illustrations are given for our assurance and encouragement. During this time of trouble, we should accept them and appropriate them to ourselves. We should enter and dwell in the secret place of the Most High, separating ourselves from and rising above the turmoil that is on every side. The Lord invites us to do this. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a moment until the indignation be over. Overpassed. That was in Isaiah 26 20. How can we do this? There is no literal door to a secret place, no literal fortress, no literal feathers, and no literal wings. How then do we have access to this secret place of refuge? Is this place purely imaginary, only in the mind? His truth shall be thy shield and butler. The psalmist says, This is the key. <clears throat> Do you remember the truth? Do you really believe in the divine plan and your place in it? Are you running for the prize of the high calling for which you have given up all earthly hopes? Are you a member of the body of Christ? Are you a new creature? Are you following in the footsteps of Jesus? To sum up, you are really in the truth and is the truth, are you really in the truth and is the truth in you? If yes, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler, and to you the secret place of the Most High is a very real, literal, and substantial condition, a condition in which the almighty power of God overshadows you. It is a very real arrangement whereby God's protecting care is a safe refuge for you, like a strong fortress around you. He literally delivers you from the snare of the fowler, Satan. If you are in the truth and you truly and actually have the Lord's complete and absolute protection from everything injurious to your highest spiritual welfare, there is nothing imaginary about it. This wonderful condition is a real and tangible thing. We are truly and entirely surrounded by the power of God in this secret place of the Most High. Psalms 139.5, Leaser Translation, Behind and before hast thou hedged me in, and thou placest me upon me thy hand. Sometimes we tend to forget that we are in this secret place and become frightened at the uncertain conditions of the world and the situations that we face every day. We may find that a lot of our experiences come from our mental anxieties and anxiousness 
Satan loves to have us start to worry about things. Oh, doesn't he ever? Which comes quite natural to us as human beings. We become panicky like Peter seeking to walk on the water, who, when he saw the boisterous wind tossing, toss sea, began to sink, crying, Lord, save me. Matthew 14, 30. When this happens, to us there is a door we can use to again enter our secret place. In Matthew 6, verse 6, it states, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. That's a private room or a private place. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father who seeth in secret, who seeth in secret, and thy Father who seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This is like the frightened child who runs to its mother to be enfolded safely in her arms. In Deuteronomy 33, 27, we read, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Back to Psalms 91, we read in verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. This terror by night is what the world of mankind is experiencing now. In the night just preceding the full dawn of the millennial mediatorial phase of the kingdom, millennial day. We read about this time in Psalms 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. While it is still called day, while opportunities for service still exist, we can expect Satan to attack us with his arrows of opposition and false doctrines. <clears throat> Psalm 64, 3 calls these arrows bitter words. We will not fear those arrows because we have on the whole armor of God, regarding which Paul says in Ephesians 6, 16, Above all, take in the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Psalms, back to Psalms 91, verse 6, Nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. The Lord's people are not promised immunity from literal plagues or pestilences. The reference is to deceptive doctrines, doctrines so deceptive, so gradually introduced, so insidious that if possible, they will deceive the very elect. The may brought in Matthew 24, 24. Like the virus of a plague, unseen and only recognized after it has done its dirty work, it has caused many thousands to waste away from the truth. This is why the next verse of the psalm says in Psalms 91, 7, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold, and see the reward of the wicked not come nigh thee. This is true only if we have made his truth our shield and butler. We must not lower the shield, even slightly. Now we come to the precious and reassuring part of the psalm, which speaks personally and individually to each one who has found refuge in the secret place of the Most High. Psalms, back to Psalms 91, verse 8. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. And verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. And in verse 10, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. No evil befall thee means this does not refer to the common, ordinary evils of the present evil world. It does not refer to the daily difficulties and annoyances we experience to which Jesus referred when he said, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Matthew 6.34 Such evils do not amount to much. We can take them in stride and are not entirely shielded from each such evils. What then is this special and serious evil from which we are promised protection? Ask ourselves, 
what is the greatest possible loss I could sustain? What is the most valuable thing I could lose? The answer is, of course, the truth. If we lose the truth and subsequently the Lord's approval, there is nothing left. We have lost everything. This would be the supreme evil, and it is the evil referred to in the psalm. If you remain in the secret place of the Most High, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. You will stay in the truth. You will not dash thy foot against a stone. You will never deny the ransom. Jesus will never be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to you as he has been for so many. Psalms, back to Psalms 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. How many angels are given charge or care over us? How many are in this room or online right now as we are in the convention? <clears throat> we don't exactly know, but there are many. And they are given by our Heavenly Father to watch over us. In the Precious Promises on page 12, we read, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the world, whole world to show himself strong in, on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Second Chronicles 16.9 These eyes referred to are the Lord's influence his power of knowing whatever this the means. God has means, no doubt, far superior to any of ours. He tells us that angels are his ministers and that these have charge over his people. <clears throat> but the angels of the Lord have a charge more particularly over us of the gospel church than over any other of the Lord's people of any any previous time in the world's history. The Lord is especially interested in spiritual Israel. These angels then care for us, supervise our affairs, and are God's agencies or channels of communication to us as to his will. This is communication in the sense of providences for us, causing these providences or the other providences. Reprints 5634, and 35. Psalms, back to Psalms 91, 12, they shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And in verse 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, and the young lion and the dragon shall, shalt thou trample under feet. What does it mean treading upon the adder? <clears throat> because we are in the secret place of the Most High, because he is our refuge and our fortress, because we are under his wings, because he has given us angels charge over us to keep us in all his ways, we shall triumph over every device, Satan, every device of Satan, whether it be an attempt to overpower us or to deceive us, whether he goes about as a roaring lion or whether snake-like, he stealthily works about to inject his venomous poison. We tread upon him, trample him, we spurn his devices, <clears throat> we reject him. We also know that soon the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, Romans 16, 20. Uh, third, about us and what he will yet do for us. The one he is speaking to is undoubtedly his Logos, our Lord Jesus Christ who has gone satisfying us with long life. To this wonderful promise of immunity, we reply in the language of the psalmist, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I will when I awake in thy likeness. Psalm 17, 15. And with these words, dear friends, I hope that you have received a blessing on the comfort from the fact that we have the protection of our father like a hen is gathers her chicks and protection i always like the thought of protecting in the covert of the wings that means a hollow part of the wings and that's a 
that is a protection about us. So may the Lord add his blessings and uh, turn it back over to you, Brother Bill. Thank you, Brother Al. We appreciate that you're able to humble us so much in showing us how small we are first compared to God's universe and compared to him, but then uplift us to help us to know that we have the assurance that we are cared for by this wonderful creator of the universe, and we have such a position to be under his wings as his children, his, his chicks. Um, you made some of the brethren cry a little bit over that uh, hen story or that partridge story, though, and, uh, but we appreciate the lessons so very much. Uh, based on what you have said, we'd like to uh, play one verse of O oh, Worship the King, because it seems very appropriate, and then we will ask you to close with prayer. So here it is. Brother Albert. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Dear Father, we do thank thee for this privilege we had to look over the words of thy protecting hand over us. We thank thee for the truth. We do thank thee for that wonderful insight into thy plans and purposes, the scriptural truth. And we do thank thee for the understanding of that scriptural truth via the penmanship of our dear pastor with all the writings that he has given us. We do thank thee for the gift of thy dear son, Jesus, that through a sacrifice, all may receive life. We thank you for the promises. We thank you for all the restitution blessings that we see around us daily. We thank thee for thy overruling providences. We do thank you for this privilege we have that we can have this convention. And we do ask thee to bless all thy dear children the world over, be with ones that are going through special trials at this time. We do ask thee for an extra measure of thy Holy Spirit, dear Father, extra measure of faith and an extra measure of trust. And gracious Father, as we go along in this narrow way, we do want to at all times place all things at thy feet to have thee outwork, to work out the things, whether they be problems, the decisions, worryings, anxieties, depressions. Dear Father, we leave it in thy hands because we know that thou wilt work things out according to thy will. We, knew, we know all things work to, for the, all, all things work to good, that all the ones that love thee, and we do truly love thee, dear Father. Gracious Father, we do leave ourselves in thy care and keeping, and we do ask a blessing for the further of this day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.